I'm here at the Bible College in the northern part of Peru, teaching a two-week class on 2 Corinthians. Uh, the Bible College has been here for a lot of years, and uh, elevation's 8,700 feet. I'm still getting used to the uh, altitude. Definitely takes your breath away a little bit, and I uh, should get used to it about halfway through the trip. Um, tonight, we're going to continue on in our, in our study in the book of the Revelation. If you're just joining, if you've never been on this channel before, uh, I am Pastor Bill Walden. I pastor Cornerstone Fellowship in Napa, California. It's a Calvary Chapel church. And I also have a ministry called Build Up the Church. It's a nonprofit, uh, kind of a side ministry that I've had for about five years. And uh, it exists to, uh, host, to host my sermon notes, and I'm kind of developing the website and putting up more and more of my sermon notes online both in English and in Spanish, to use as a resource for those who want to study the Bible a little bit more. Uh, those are obviously available for free for any, anybody that wants to take a look at them. It also has a schedule of my travel dates and things like that. It also has a place where people can donate if they want to kind of help me get from one place to another and also to kind of develop the website. So anyway, welcome. Uh, here we are in Revelation chapter 11. The book is called Revelation. It's not Revelations. There's a lot of things, plural, that are happening in the book of the Revelation, but it's really a revelation about Jesus Christ. It's a revelation about what the Bible terms as the last days on planet Earth, kind of the last season of, uh, of life as we know it. Um, the last seven years, which includes a lot of judgment. God is a loving God. He's also a... a just and holy God. And so he is both perfectly loving and perfectly holy at the same time. And uh, this last seven year period upon the earth, uh, the judgments of God really do come forth. And so is there's some heaviness to the book. Uh, there's also some encouragement in the book, that's for sure. As throughout the book of the Revelation, God continually gives people an opportunity to ask for forgiveness and to turn to him and be forgiven and be saved and go to heaven. And so it's a heavy book. It's also a book of prophecy in case you don't know. And prophecy is just simply the things yet to come. Uh, the fancy kind of the scholarly word is eschatology, study of the last things or the last days. A lot of, uh, def a lot of debate on you know, what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, the best thing we can do is read our Bibles and to think it through and to try to come up with a reasonable, logical conclusion about what we believe. Uh, I never, I, I'm happy to get into discussions with people about the last days, but I never want to argue about it because quite simply, it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, who knows, you know? But I do have some strong opinions on it and I do teach my opinions. I do uh, on occasions share alternate views, but I want to bring forth what I believe is, is the truth. And uh, if I'm wrong, it's, a, it's an honest mistake. And uh, like I said, I'm not here to, to have any fights with anybody, but to study the Bible and to try to prepare our hearts and to understand the nature of God. So let me pray and we'll get started. Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray that you would open our minds, um, like the song that I just sang, open the eyes of our hearts uh, so that we can see you. So bless my friends online, those who are watching and listening. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 11, we read about an interesting event that is going to happen. The seeds of this interesting event are already in existence. Uh, it's the rebuilding of the next Jewish temple. I've had the uh, blessing of going to Israel twice. It's been quite a while, but um, there are lots of people there that want to see the Jewish temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And there are some foundations and some organi organizations Temple Mount Faithful and the, and the, and the uh, Temple Foundation. I think that's the name of it. I don't recall. And they are already making plans to rebuild uh, the temple. Uh, for the Jews, this was the most holy place in their history. This is where they came to worship God. There were certain men who were priests and there were certain utensils used in the worship of God according to Judaism. These uh, very religious Jews have already made the clothing for the priests. They've already fabricated uh, the gold uh, utensils, the uh, seven-branched candlestick that goes inside of the temple and other utensils that are uh, dictated by God for Jewish worship. 
And so they are very much looking forward to building this temple. And so this, this it's been kind of right on the cusp of this happening for, for quite a while. And so uh, here we read in the, in the book of the Revelation in Revelation chapter 11, that indeed there will be another temple that is built. And as I said, we see the seeds of it. We see the beginning of it already in existence. So um, I like to view the book of the Revelation and prophecy in this way, that, that the newspapers or the, the social media, the news outlets uh, don't tell us what the Bible is gonna do. The Bible tells us what it's gonna do and the news media is always catching up with those events. And so as we see many aspects of news media, we can't obviously can't trust all of it. But when we see some aspects of news media, we can many times see that it's pointing to future things that the Bible talks about. So, you know, if you're a Bible student, you read your Bible and then keep your eyes open and you notice things, you notice things a little bit differently. So let me read a little bit here. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, uh, verses one and one to three. John is writing, he, he's having visions. God is showing him the future. So of course it isn't in front of his eyes physically. It's, it's he's seeing things in a, in a spiritual realm, but he's describing to us what he sees. And he says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles. So that's a real important fact. We're gonna look back in the book of Daniel in just a few minutes and see that that's already been spoken about a, a, a thousand years before this was written. So, and the Gentiles will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months or three and a half years. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So we're only gonna cover 12 verses today because it's kind of deep and thick uh, study material. Let me give you a little bit of history on, on, on Judaism and the worship of God as was given to the Jews. Now, obviously the worship of God is different for Christians, but when God began to reach out to people, he reached out to the, to the Jewish people and this was what he told them to do. So we're just gonna trace a little bit of the history here. Let me read to you some from the notes. By the way, uh, my notes, my sermon notes are getting posted right now on my, on my uh, webpage. And also they are on my Facebook page and you can follow along if you'd like. So let me just read from my notes. It's kind of technical and just, I'll just read and we'll get the facts. So the history of the tabernacle or the temple. The temple is more of a, of, of a permanent building, a solid building built with stone and wood. But while the, the nation of Israel was traveling, traveling through the wilderness, they, they worshiped God instead of at a building made of stones, they, they worshiped God in a portable dwelling, kind of like a big tent. So on the tabernacle, it was called the tabernacle. On Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the exact design for the tabernacle. It's a portable structure for worship. As the children of Israel were led by God through the, through the wilderness, through the desert, they would you know, stop and stay for a while. They'd put up this portable tent dwelling and they would worship God there. And when God was leading them on, they'd pack it all up, they'd carry it to the next location. So it had to be portable. So the presence of God accompanied the Israelites in their wilderness wanderings. And God says, and the Bible says, that at night God showed himself to be with them and he would, he would appear as in a pillar of fire. And it was just, and at night, it kind of makes sense. He would kind of light up the camp. Now there was millions of Jews that left Egypt and left slavery. So he gave them light at night. They could step out their tents at night and you know they would see the presence of God. He was giving them assurance. During the day, God... Uh, manifested himself as a, as a cloud over this great multitude of people. Remember, they're going through the desert. So what a great way for God to manifest himself. They always had some shade. <laughs> it was a thing of presence and comfort, not only physically, but spiritually, mentally, emotionally. So God was with them. So the tabernacle was that portable tent dwelling, which they uh, would have to set up, break down, move around all the time. When they got to the, nation, to the land of Canaan, which is later called Israel, a permanent building was erected by Solomon. And Solomon was the third king in Israel and he was the son of King David. And that, that temple was used from 957 BC until 587 BC when the Babylonians came into Israel and they destroyed the temple and they took 
a lot of Jews captive into Babylon and they were in exile. They were deported to Babylon for 70 years. After 70 years, there were people that God raised up, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, others, uh, particularly Zerubbabel and Ezra, to, to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild another temple. And uh, because that's how God wanted the Jews to worship him, one place and one building. So the second temple is called uh, Zerubbabel's temple. He helped to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That temple was used from 520 BC until 19 BC. It had a smaller footprint. Then King Herod from the Roman Empire came in and he started remodeling it. And it's thought that he was remodeling the temple and adding to it uh, to, to gain favor with the Jewish people. He was a governor from Rome. And at the time of Jesus, the Romans were an occupying force in Israel. And so he wanted to kind of win some of their favor so as to keep the peace. Uh, one of the things that, is, that Rome hated was that if the people they conquered or, or that when they inhabited a foreign land, when they were occupiers, they didn't want the people revolting. So it's kind of thought that Herod was courting favor with them. And so during the time of Jesus, we read about Herod's temple. So Herod's temple is simply an extension or an add-on from Zerubbabel's temple. And that temple was used until 70 AD. And in 70 AD, the Bible or history tells us that Rome came and by then uh, the Jews were in revolt. They had had enough of Rome's a foot upon their neck and they were in revolt and they were fighting against Rome. So uh, the Romans came in 70 AD and they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. There's an episode in the gospels where Jesus and the disciples are walking by the temple and the disciples say, Master, look at this amazing temple. And he said to them, I'm telling you, the time is coming when not one stone will be left upon another. Inside of the temple, there was a lot of gold used uh, as decorations and to, to, to beautify the inside of the temple. When the Romans came, uh, they set the temple on fire. The gold melted down in between the cracks of, of the large stones and the soldiers, being greedy, of course, took one stone down off of another. And so Jesus' prediction came absolutely true. So there's no, currently, there's no uh, archaeological evidence, per se, of a temple ever being built. If you go to Israel today, there's archaeological evidence of a lot of things. But the temple was completely dismantled uh, because they wanted the gold that was melted and fell down between the cracks which Jesus had predicted would happen. And so since 70 AD, the Jewish people have not had a, they have not had a temple. And so they have not been able to carry on with their worship. Now, uh, for many years, they have been displaced, but the, 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 the nation of Israel was reborn again in 1948. And since then, uh, Israelis, Hebrews, Jews have been coming back into the country and now they want to rebuild the temple again. And so that kind of leads us up to the present day. Currently, there is no worship, there's no Jewish worship on the Temple Mount. Now, the Muslims took control of Jerusalem in 637 AD. And currently, they have uh, two buildings there. There's a mosque called the al Asqa Mosque. And also, the Dome of the Rock is an Islamic shrine there. And those are holy places to the Muslims. So when I went to Israel, and when people still go to Israel today, they'll let anybody up on the Temple Mount. But if you bow your head and your lips are moving, they believe you're praying, they'll come over and tell you to stop right away because it's, it's a holy site to the Muslims. And so you can visit the Temple Mount today. You can see these two Muslim buildings. But there is no Jewish building like there used to be during the time of Jesus and up until 70 AD. In the Six-Day War of 1967, Israel regained control of that part of Jerusalem, but they wanted to keep the peace, and, and a lot of Israelis hate what happened, that the Israeli government allowed the Muslims to have authority over the Temple Mount area. And so when you see the Jewish people praying at the Western Wall, and they're doing this, and there's, they're putting their prayer requests in between the cracks of the stone, that's the western side of the Temple Mount. That, that wall was built by Solomon. Up above that is, is the Muslim-controlled 
Temple Mount. And a lot of times when they want to start a fight or something, they'll just start throwing rocks down at the Jews and it's kind of a constant, constant problem. So anyway, there's two Islamic places of worship on the Temple Mount today. There is no Jewish place of worship. But here we are reading and in other places we are reading that another temple is going to be built. So um, the next temple to be built, read verses one and two again. That's history. That brings us up to Revelation chapter 11, verse one and two. Then I, John, was given a reed like a measuring rod. So just something very physical. And the angel stood telling to John, rise up and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Leave out the court, of, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now this future season of time that we're reading about is called the Great Tribulation Period. And it's a seven year period. John is told here that there's going to be a treading underfoot of Jerusalem by unbelievers for half of that time. I believe the second half of that time of Jerusalem, of, of the great tribulation period, excuse me. John here is told to rise and measure the temple that he sees in a vision. So it's like you're gonna build a house, what do you do? You consult the architect. You start making the drawings, you start making the plans. John sees that this temple is still in the future and it isn't metaphorical. It's an actual temple that we believe is going to be built. He's told to exclude the court of the Gentiles and we'll get to that in a minute. If you t visit the Temple Mount today, there's a section to the north of the Islamic buildings that is sufficient to, to house or to host or to accommodate the, the dimensions that John measures off. So conceivably, uh, if there were to be, or, or I should say when, when the next temple is built, it could cohabitate with the two Islamic buildings. There's room on the Temple Mount for that to happen. Many people do believe that. That could be uh, something that is fostered by some wonderful politician, perhaps the Antichrist, who wants to bring everybody on his side until he wants to finally take control over their lives. So that's, that's a thought, okay? The next temple will have a smaller footprint. It'll be less square feet than Herod's temple. So let me read to you. I believe the next temple to be built will not be the final temple. There'll be another temple after the next one. The next temple will be defiled by the Antichrist. I'm of the opinion that Antichrist is going to help, you know, the Muslims and the Jews broker a peace deal. And there's been constant conflict in the Middle East, hasn't there? That's easy to see. I remember when Jimmy Carter was president, Yes, I'm that old. And he was trying to broker a peace deal between the Arabs and the Jews, and it's just constant fighting. And they're both claiming uh, to have authority and ownership uh, of all of Israel. And so it, it, we've seen this tension brewing for decades, at least decades in my life. So I think the Antichrist is gonna make it so that they can quote unquote coexist. And if you're familiar with that bumper sticker, coexist, you know, it's, that, it's kind of that idea that he's gonna broker a peace deal. But the next temple will be defiled by the Antichrist after it's built. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. It'll be built for Jews, by the Jews, so they can practice Judaism. Ezekiel has a vision of a temple also in the Old Testament, but it's a lot larger. I think it's gonna be the temple after the next temple, okay? The current temple mount has 37 acres. Ezekiel's temple, which we're really not gonna talk about tonight. We'll, we'll get to that later on as we study the book of the Revelation. Ezekiel's temple will cover 512 acres. So huge difference, huge difference. Right now we're just considering what's gonna happen next. Now there's an Old Testament prophecy if you're following along with my notes in the book of Daniel. And Daniel is talking about this guy called the Antichrist, this guy that's gonna come and the prefix anti doesn't mean just mean against Christ, but it also in the Greek language means instead of Christ. He's a false Messiah. My understanding of the situation is that if you go to Israel today and you ask a Jewish person who is a religious Jewish person, how do you know when the Messiah will come? And their answer is he will bring peace. So the Bible tells us now that there's, that there's some person that's gonna come and he's gonna bring a peace treaty, a covenant for seven years, like seven year covenant. 
And in the middle of that covenant, he's gonna break the deal and he's gonna change the rules. Let me read to you from Daniel chapter nine, verse 27. Talking about this person, I believe, who is the Antichrist, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, one week is another way to say seven years. When we say a dozen, everybody knows that we mean 12. It could be a dozen eggs, it could be a dozen pizzas. When you say a decade, it means 10. So he's gonna confirm a covenant with many for one week, a group of seven. Uh, a seven day peace treaty makes no sense at all. A seven month peace treaty, not very effective. A seven year peace treaty, people could feel some stability. So that's, that's what I'm persuaded about. But it says in the middle of the week, after three years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In order to bring an end to Jewish sacrifice, which can only take place at the temple, and the offerings that they make at the temple, in order to bring an end to them, they have to first exist. So as I said, the Temple Mount Foundation and other groups in Israel right now are preparing to, to rebuild the temple. We read in the book of Daniel, prophetic, futuristic prophecy, that there's gonna be a guy who makes uh, a covenant, a peace treaty with many people, a seven-year peace treaty, in the middle of it, he's gonna stop the agreement and he's gonna bring an end to sacrifice and offering, which just tells us there has to be a temple built in order for there to be sacrifice and offering. And then it says, on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Abomination is to take something that is holy and to defile it. We read from other sections in the Bible um, and if you're following me in in the, through the study of the book of the Revelation, I often say that studying Revelation is like coloring by the numbers. You know, you, color, you, color, you, cover, you color all the red tiles and then you color all the blue tiles and you still don't know what it is. You color all the yellow, brown, and green. By the time you get to the purple, you're thinking, oh, now I see what this is. It's a little boy flying a kite. You couldn't tell as you were putting it together. Prophet, studying prophecy is very much like that. We put the pieces together. So this guy's gonna bring a seven-year peace treaty. He's gonna allow the Jews to rebuild the temple, but he will violate that contract and stop temple worship. If you're reading my notes, Daniel eleven thirty one, 31, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist marches in to the temple of God, First, he helps the Jews build it. Then he marches into it and says, actually, I'm God. And that's an abomination. And it's an abomination. It's a defilement of the temple that makes the Jews leave. It's a, then it becomes des desolate. It's abomination that leads to desolation. It's such a heinous, sinful thing that he does that the Jews just totally depart from the temple and have nothing to do with it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, now notice this, and we're gonna connect some dots here. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, how long is that? Three and a half years, halfway through a seven year tribulation period, and the abomination of desolation is set up. So that tells us when the abomination of desolation is set up, when Antichrist goes into the temple and says, I'm God, everybody has to worship me. By the way, he's not just against Christians. He's against Jews, he's against Mormons, he's against Seventh-day Adventists, he's against Baha'i, he's against Hindus, he's against Buddhists, he's against everybody. He says, there is no religion except me. So that's what this guy's gonna do. The abomination of desolation is set up and there shall be 1,290 days. And so once again, we're looking at another three and a half year uh, period this one adds 30 days longer. We're gonna talk about that later. There's a reason for that. So what do we have so far? John, I want you to measure, you're the architect. Measure out the, the, the parameter for the new temple. We know currently Jews wanna rebuild the temple. We know currently Muslims don't want a temple up there. They don't want Jews up there. It's a, it's a disputed piece of real estate. They fight over it. By the way, uh, a lot of uh, Islamic countries will say that Israel belongs to them and that they need the land. Israel, if you look at a map of all the Islamic countries uh, in the eastern part of what we would call the Middle East, um, Israel is only one-sixth of 1% of that geography. 
Israel isn't even 1% of all that land. It's only one sixth of 1%. So they don't need the land. This is a spiritual fight. This is to fight against the one and true living God. And so notice that the Antichrist isn't going to do this in some Hindu shrine. He's not going to do it in some Islamic shrine. He's going to do it in, in the shrine or the temple of the true and the living God, the God of Jehovah, Jehovah God, uh, God the Father, who's connected to God the Son, who's connected to God the Holy Spirit. New Testament prophecies that join together. Remember, we're connecting the dots, we're filling in the mosaic. Matthew 24, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation. So Jesus is quoting Daniel. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, once again in the temple, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of town because things are gonna get bad. It's an abomination that causes desolation. I'm looking at my time and I'm, I think we're gonna have time and we're gonna turn over to 2 Thessalonians if you, if you want, 2 Thessalonians, or you can just bookmark it if you want and uh, you can join, you can read that later. We see another passage that talks about the same thing. I'm just gonna try to read through it quickly. Paul is talking about the last days. He says, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Day of Christ is when Jesus physically comes back to the earth. Let no one deceive you. That day will not come unless a falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshiped, so here it is, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So here we have a prophecy from Daniel, hundreds of years previously. In the New Testament, we have, or in the Gospels, we have the words of Jesus referring to the book of Daniel. And then we also have the words of the Apostle Paul. So once again, uh, prophecy is putting together a mosaic. It's, color, it's coloring by the numbers. And as we do it, something kind of comes into shape. I remember those little kaleidoscope things when I was a kid. You know, you would turn them and you'd get different pictures and that kind of thing. It's much like that. And so as we study, things come into perspective. So this temple that John measures is not the temple as described by Ezekiel. That's another temple. The outer court of the Gentiles, this temple is not included. It's not included in this temple. When the Jews had their temple in Jerusalem, there were people that they called God-fearers. And these were, these were Greeks, these were Gentiles or Romans that realized that the paganism and the idolatry of their world was false. And they began to want to worship the one true and the living God. The Jews would let them come near the temple, but not come as close as the Jews could. So they was called the court of the Gentiles. They were only allowed, allowed so close to the actual temple of God under penalty of death if they came any closer. So John is told, Measure out the footprint of the, new, um, of the new temple, but don't worry about the court of the Gentiles. It could be that if they included that, it wouldn't fit on the current temple mount. So just another consideration. The outer court of the Gentiles is not included. These Gentiles will be against Jerusalem for 42 months or, or three and a half years. There's another reason there. Uh, we are told during this second half of the Great Tribulation period. What, what starts the second half of the Great Tribulation period? The Antichrist says he's God. And to, to live or to buy or to sell, to buy food or get medical care or anything, you have to take what is called the mark of the beast. It's a sign of allegiance. You know, in, in America, we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. In, in the book of the Revelation, you say, I pledge allegiance to the Antichrist. And you get the number on your forehead or on your, on your hand. And so it's, reasonable to expect that hatred towards any other thing that's called God is going to increase. And so there's a trampling of uh, the city of Jerusalem. There's an anti-Jewish sentiment that super rises up. We read here, leave out the court of the Gentiles, leave out the court which is outside the temple, do not measure it, it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. The word tread means to trample with contempt, to, to just walk all over something because you hate it. Probably takes place during the second half of the seven-year tribulation period. 
This is when the Antichrist is most active. The millennial temple, Ezekiel's temple, will come later. This, seems, this temple seems to be limited to the Jews. We're going to take a quick look at these two witnesses. We have just a few minutes left. He says in verse 3, I'll give power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy 100, one, excuse me, 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So prophets are those who speak for God. They are humble witnesses. They're clothed in sackcloth. They preach for three and a half years. They are sent to proclaim God's truth in the most ungodly time in human history. When a man claims to be God, when a man is possessed by Satan, goes into the temple of God and outlaws every other religion except the worship of himself. They are described in verse four as olive trees and lampstands. Verse four says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. So you don't mess with these guys. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heavens so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So these are described as olive trees and lampstands. Olive oil was used in oil lamps, so they are giving spiritual light to the world, if you will. They are presented as olive trees and, and lampstands. Okay, I've said that. They are presented as two men with an ongoing supply of power to tell the truth. If you have a lampstand with, a, with a, a reservoir of oil in it, you have to keep refilling it. But if that lampstand is connected to an olive tree, it's just a constant supply of oil, and that's the idea. They have a constant supply of God's strength to tell the people the truth uh, about the Antichrist, about uh, their own sinfulness, about the love of God, about the righteousness and holiness of God. They are there to be witnesses. Their preaching brings spiritual light to Jerusalem. They are divinely protected. They're equipped also to defend themselves. They have divine power to affect nature. And that's to prove a point to those who are watching. Who are they? Don't know. Some people will say Zerubbabel from the book of Zechariah. Other people say Moses and Elijah because of the uh, dramatic power that they had as, uh, as prophets and as men of God. In the end, they will, they will be killed. Verse seven, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. So where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. So by this time, Jerusalem is called Sodom in Egypt because it's so ungodly. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets, because of these two prophets who tormented, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell upon the earth. So they're divinely protected until their ministry is complete, then Satan kills them. They're hated, they're hated by the world because of their testimony and their bodies are left in the street. They're not even buried. And the hatred of humanity will be great against these men because they spoke powerfully against the truths of God, against the, against, excuse me, the hatred of humanity will be great against these two men because they spoke powerfully of the truths of God. So people are, are just, not, they're not gonna wanna hear it. Acts chapter seven, Stephen, they stoned him because they didn't wanna hear the truth. So same thing's gonna happen. And they're so happy about it uh, that people send send gifts to one another all around the world. It also says, very interesting, people from tribes, tongues, nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. There's gonna be a worldwide ability to see their dead bodies in the streets. And in, now in the 80s, when I started studying the Bible, we used to think it was satellite TV. Now it's an iPhone. <laughs> There's gonna be a worldwide broadcast, and probably even something more uh, developed than just a simple iPhone. The whole world's gonna see this, and they're gonna be so happy. These freak prophets who have been telling us that we're bad people, that we're wrong, and that God's gonna judge us. Finally, they're dead. We're so happy we're gonna have like another Christmas. And it's gonna be a worldwide celebration. Verse 11 and 12, and then we're gonna be done. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. No kidding. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here, and they ascended to a to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. Uh, verse 13, overlap a little bit. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. 
The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So God revives them, takes them to heaven. He shows us authority uh, over ungodly Jerusalem, sends an earthquake. A tenth of it is, de is, de is destroyed. But guys, before the earthquake and before the destruction, what had been happening? Three and a half years of two godly men inviting people to turn from their sins. God is patient. God is long-suffering. He sends his spokesmen to speak to a very ungodly world that's worshiping a man as God and pledging their allegiance to one called the Antichrist. And God is patient. And he gives another three and a half year time span where he's just pleading with people, you know. After they are killed and resurrected, then there's some more judgment that comes. It's just the typical thing that we see in the book of the Revelation. What are the lessons for us? Let me try to make some applications. Keep watching the conflict around Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Just, if you see anything in the newspaper, read it about the Temple Mount. Go online and read about the Temple Mount Foundation. The conflict isn't about the land. I already mentioned that. It's about uh, God's ordained place where his people, the Jews, will worship him. Watch the, pre, the peace process regarding Israel and the Palestinians. It's constantly flaring up. Um, just notice how often it's in the news. Peace in the Middle East. A peace broker will arrive, probably the Antichrist, and a seven-year peace contract will be established. I think we'll be gone by then. We'll see. The Bible doesn't confirm the headlines. The headlines confirm the Bible. And even at the most ungodly time in history, God has his servants offering forgiveness. So knowing predictive prophecy shapes our worldview and helps us understand God's sovereignty. So that's why we study prophecy. So lot, lot that we tackled tonight. Went a few minutes longer than I like to go. Want to keep it in bite-sized chunks. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, once again, if you're just joining, my name is Pastor Bill Walden. I'm pastor at Cornerstone Fellowship in Napa. Glad to be with you. I have a ministry called Build Up the Church, and you can find it at builduptthechurch.com. I also have a YouTube channel, and all these uh, sermon videos are uh, uploaded there. So just look for me, Build Up the Church, or Pastor Bill Walden on YouTube, and you can review these things. So God bless you. Thanks for watching. Once again, greetings from Peru. I'll be here next Monday. We have a good internet signal, so it's, it's all ahead. All systems go. So God bless you guys. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.